I consider myself a physical oceanography now, a uh, physical oceanographer now, uh, but my background is very much in fluid mechanics and um, something I'm always doing as an oceanographer as well. I lead a, a small group here at this institute in Germany. Um, we focus on small scale physics and turbulence, uh, mostly in coastal oceanography setting. Okay, I'm going to talk a bit about the Arctic. If I can change the slide. Um, just some very brief background here. The main motivation for this work and for a lot of the oceanography, the physical oceanography that's being done in the Arctic right now is devoted to understanding the sea ice cover and why it is changing so rapidly, why it's disappearing so rapidly. Uh, this is really important uh, on climate scales and for, for climate in general because there's an extremely important climate feedback mechanism that occurs and that's the ice albedo feedback as the sea ice coverage uh, decreases you, you get more open water and this changes the albedo and more sunlight and more heat is trapped in seawater and is not reflected back to space and so you get an increased heating so understanding the ocean the oceanic role that is taking place um, or maybe not taking place in this in this melting of the sea ice requires the quantification of fluxes, heat fluxes, uh, and in order to do that, you need to understand something about the turbulent fluxes. And just to put this in perspective, I put a plot in the September sea ice extent. September is where the sea ice minimum occurs, so you can see where we might be in in the decades from now. And it looks like we might hit ice-free summers in around 50 years if you just linearly extrapolate that curve downwards. Um, and that's a really, really big deal. So we have to really understand what's going on here. Just some basics about the Arctic Ocean. Um, the Arctic Ocean water column is something I'm plotting here. It consists of essentially two scalars that are determining the density. There's salinity and there's temperature. I'm using conservative temperature and absolute salinity. Um, these are hopefully things you're familiar with, but they're basically just um, more conservative forms of, of looking at temperature and salinity, like potential temperature. Um, what you can see in this profile is that salinity varies by large amounts in the Arctic Ocean, much, much more than most any other place on Earth. Um, and the reason is because the Arctic is a semi-enclosed sea it has a lot of fresh water inputs in the form of rivers and runoff and this creates very fresh surface water conditions and creates a very very stable stratification and you can see also that temperature is doing some kind of crazy stuff um, you've got temperature increasing temperature decreasing depends where you are in the water column and the reason for this is because the density is dominated by salinity so if you're going to take anything away from this plot here that i'm showing Take away the fact that it's very strongly stratified in the upper ocean and that density is really being dominated by the salinity differences and then temperature is kind of free to do what it wants to do. And you can see there's a lot of variability which I'm plotting in the temperature. Okay, um, also notice that there are some deep sources of ocean heat that could potentially be available for melting ice. The first comes from the Atlantic Ocean. It inflows through the Barents Sea uh, north of Norway on the shelf and through Fram Strait uh, around Spitsbergen and it descends in depth and it moves around the Arctic Basin and you can see it here in this big bump that's around 350-400 meters in this profile that I'm showing. There's another inflow, the Pacific water inflow, it's much shallower but it also brings heat in and you can't really see it in this curve here so much but you can see it in the variability, this envelope that I'm plotting in the temperature curve. Um, and these maximums are, are inflows that come from the, the Pacific water that's entering through the Bering Strait. Okay, here's some broad research questions that I am interested in and other people are interested in and we're working towards answering, but I will not answer any of these in this talk. I'll answer some more specific ones. Um, is there significant vertical transport uh, and heat fluxes that are contributing to sea ice melt in the ocean? That's a big question. I think if you ask oceanographers, they'll probably say yes. But if you ask non-oceanographers, they might say they might have different answers. 
Um, another one is what sets the vertical transport of heat from the deep source waters, and I'm talking about this Pacific and these Atlantic waters, uh, sorry, this, yeah, the Pacific and Atlantic water inflows, and what sets heat transport in the strongly stratified halocline. These are really special conditions in the ocean, and um, it's not clear yet what, what processes are acting to transport heat vertically. So we want to understand these heat transports better, particularly in, this, in the halocline where the salinity changes very rapidly and deeper down. Um, just a slide about some methods that we use. Uh, I'm going to talk about a lot of observations and our primary tool for doing this is the ocean glider. If you've never seen one before, this is what they look like uh, here on the top left and at the bottom. They're essentially underwater vehicles. They are autonomous, so there's nobody sitting on there piloting them. They're buoyancy driven, which means they have no propeller. They have a pump, which is um, retracted and, and it alters the buoyancy of the vehicle. And that allows it to rise and sink through the water column and move forward because it's got lift from the hull and the wings. You can customize it with various sensors like an ADCP, which is something that can measure ocean currents with depth. And um, particular for us, we like to strap these microstructure profilers on, which is this, if you could see my cursor, this, this black tube on top. And it has these tiny little sensors that poke out the front of the vehicle. And these measure turbulence. They have um, very fine scale temperature sensors as well as shear probes to measure very small scale turbulent scale shear in the water column um, you can do very special things with these gliders that you can't do using normal uh, measurement techniques with microstructure profilers like this this is me on the back of a ship on a lake in switzerland on a very nice day enjoying taking some profiles but you know it's not as easy in the arctic ship time is expensive you need icebreakers and um there are many conditions where you can simply not go out and do this type of profiling on the back of a ship. So these vehicles are very special in that regard. You can do long duration measurements uh, on the order of a month. The data set that I will talk about uh, was rather shorter, was, was around two weeks long. Okay, they move in a sort of sawtooth pattern. I think I mentioned this through the water comb, as you can see in the sketch here and you're moving forward and you're moving vertically and so you have also this mix of time and space scales which makes things a little bit difficult to interpret sometimes okay here is the data set that i'd like to to discuss these are observations they were taken in edmonton gulf that is a, a coastal region in the canadian arctic it's in the beaufort sea um, it's around 400 meters deep and um was done in, in 2015. This is what the glider did. We deployed it from the ship. It went to point number one, and then it sort of did repeat transects where it went up and down uh, the slope. And so if you look at a sort of depth distance or depth time series, as I'm plotting here, I broke it into a number of different panels, which are these transects from point one to point two to point three and back again. What you can see in this plot here is I'm plotting a long track distance, but you can also think of it as time because like I said, there's a mix of time and space scales. Depth is on the vertical axis and the colors represent something called the diffusivity. This is essentially a measure of the turbulence in the water column and how it's contributing to a turbulent vertical flux of density in this case, um, which can maybe or maybe not be equated with a vertical diffusive flux of heat. I think one thing to see is that we are not going over top of different bumps here. This is the topography in gray. We're going up the slope, back down the slope, and back up the slope again. Okay. On the left now, I'm plotting profiles of this data set averaged uh, in the sort of horizontal, the along track distance. And I'm doing two different averages to get an idea of what the profile, the mean profile of the diffusivity looks like, the turbulent transport coefficient. Uh, the black curve represents an arithmetic mean and the blue curve represents a geometric mean. Uh, you can use them to, understand different aspects of the turbulence distribution, which is log normal. 
So if you do an arithmetic average, you get an idea of, of the turbulent transports that are happening in the water column. Whereas if you do a geometric mean, this curve that's, that's blue here, you get lower values, which gives you an idea of the, the central tendency of the distribution. Okay, so let's pay attention to the black curve. What you can see um, is first of all, oh, sorry, I wanna go back. We can put two different values on here. We can put the molecular diffusion level of heat, which is this red line, and the molecular diffusion of salt, which is this orange line here. And you can see that the, if you look at the arithmetic means, you get a very low value of the diffusivity at molecular levels of heat. That's very, very low. That's uncommonly low. You don't see that in most other oceans. And even in the area where we do see some high turbulence levels, they're actually also typically low open ocean levels as well. And we've got essentially no turbulence in the upper water column, essentially no turbulence. There are here and there turbulent patches, but on average, they are very weak. Okay, um, it's interesting to look at a dimensionless number that I'll just call the strength of turbulence here. Um, and it's something called the buoyancy Reynolds number. It looks at the strength of the dissipation rate of turbulent kinetic energy. So the strength of turbulence uh, versus the strength of the stratification. So epsilon is the dissipation rate. It's measured from the glider uh, in terms of small scale shear. And we've got the buoyancy frequency squared. This is the measure of the strength of the stratification. It's the buoyancy gradient. And then we've got nu is the kinematic viscosity. This dimensionless number um, is plotted here from the data. And you can sort of very, very roughly and very hand wavy separate it into two regimes, a laminar regime and a turbulent regime. And that's what I'm plotting in this color bar on the right hand side. If you're above around 10, you are turbulent or turbulent-ish. If you are below 10, you are most likely laminar or extremely weakly turbulent. And so you can see here and there, there are patches of turbulence and there's some, some nice turbulence down here, but on the whole, everything is very laminar. Okay, what's causing the turbulence patch? Let's just pretend that there is no spatial variability and look at the temporal variability. So we're just going to average the dissipation rate in the lower couple hundred meters of the water column. And we're going to look at a frequency spectrum of the dissipation or of the mean dissipation. And this is what it looks like. And you can see there is a bump here, a significant bump here. And that is at the M2 tidal frequency, which is very close to the inertial frequency. And I'm not going to show it in this talk here. But we, um, in, in some of the papers that, that we describe this in, we make some, I think, pretty good argumentation why uh, this variability here that's present in the turbulence is actually due to the M2 tide rather than the, the, the inertial frequency. And so the takeaway messages are this. First of all, there's very low turbulence environment, extremely low. Heat fluxes are, are below a quarter of a watt per meter squared. This is not enough to melt significant amounts of sea ice. And this is only below 300 meters. Um, and this is likely driven by tide topography interaction where we see this, this large, well, not large, but where we see this turbulent behavior, we also have a region of fairly rough topography. So this is kind of matching what we expect and what other people are also finding in the Arctic in certain locations. Um, but within the halo cline and at the base of the surface mix layer where you might expect the strongest interaction with the sea ice, we see very small, even molecular levels of, of, um, of vertical turbulent diffusion. And that's where it counts the most. So um, does that mean that there's no heat transport occurring? Um, it doesn't actually. And let's take a closer look at this region and see what's going on there. Okay, so just recall that our, our criteria, our buoyancy Reynolds number to say if things are turbulent or are not turbulent in the stratified, the very strongly stratified water column of the Arctic says there's very little turbulence. So let's look a little bit at what goes into this. 
Okay, we can quantify mixing in turbulence in two different ways, actually. The first way is using the small scale shear, as I mentioned. In this case, we measure the dissipation rate of turbulent kinetic energy. That's this epsilon here by the glider. We assume a mixing efficiency or something kind of like a mixing efficiency to be around 20%. This is a very common assumption in oceanography. You don't have to make that assumption. Some people prefer to have a function of the buoyancy Reynolds number, um, but 0.2 actually works surprisingly well. Um, and that's what we're just gonna stick with for now. And so one of the assumptions that goes into this work is that the buoyancy flux then can be related very easily to the dissipation rate of turbulent kinetic energy. So how the density profile will change. And we can use this to produce this, this formula that estimates the, the turbulent diffusion coefficient of density or buoyancy, which is what I plotted in those earlier plots. And we can write the equation for that just like this, very straightforward. But we can also quantify mixing and the turbulence through the temperature field. We have, as I mentioned, micro temperature sensors that are mounted on the glider right beside these shear sensors, and they're measuring very small variations of temperature. And we can relate that to a turbulent diffusivity of temperature, K, which is related to the molecular diffusion coefficient, kappa T, and something called the Cox number. And this Cox number uh, is expressed in terms of the the dissipation rate of temperature variance, chi t, and I'll get a little bit more into that in a little bit, but this is essentially the destruction of temperature variance by small scale molecular mixing. Okay, so the Cox number measures this mixing of temperature, and we can put it all together. If we just assume, and don't think that this is always the case, because I'm not pretending that it is, but let's just assume that the temperature vertical diffusivity is the same as that of buoyancy. Okay, so this is just a simple relation between the mixing of temperature and the mixing of momentum, essentially. You can write this in a non-dimensional form, and this means that the Cox number is basically linear, linearly proportional to the buoyancy Reynolds number. Okay, this gives us a kind of expected relationship between the Cox number, which is what I'm plotting in this, in this plot on the vertical axis, and the buoyancy Reynolds number on the horizontal axis. And this should apply for flows that are sufficiently turbulent, let's say. And that is what is plotted in this blue curve in this line right here. That's this equation right here on the plot there. And people have suggested some alterations when buoyancy Reynolds number gets low, and that's what this curve is here, and we don't need to go into the details of that, but that's what is expected. And then once we hit this molecular region of buoyancy Reynolds number, we should expect it to be essentially the Cox number plus one should be one. And now I'm plotting the data below 200 meters in these, in these black points, and you can see that it's not so bad, actually. Um, we follow this curve more or less, or we, we're definitely within a factor of two, which is actually quite good for um, measuring turbulence in the ocean. And things look to be not so bad. So we're getting confident in our methods. But then if we look in what I'll call the Pacific water depths between around 50 and 125 meters, the plot looks totally different. I mean, it just looks rather stupid, actually, doesn't it? It looks wrong. It looks like something is really going wrong here. Um, and I'll get into what is happening here in the rest of the talk, actually. But you can see that maybe at higher Reynolds numbers, we are following the expected curve, but we are definitely not following at low Reynolds numbers. And what's happening here is something very bizarre, at least on first glance. And you can see what this means, the fact that you've got values way up here, is that you've got somehow a mixing of temperature but no mixing of, of momentum, right? So using the temperature sensors, you measure a whole lot of variance destruction, but, measuring, but using the shear sensors, you get very little turbulent kinetic energy dissipation. That's just weird. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna come up with a arbitrary criteria. And I'm gonna say there's these sort of freak events or these very interesting events that happen in the red region of this plot which means they've got high 
variance dissipation of temperature, but with very low dissipation of TKD. Let's take a look at what's going on here. So how can we have these events with a mixing of temperature, but with no turbulence? Let's look at where they are first in the water column. Okay, I'm showing you the same plot as before, except now I've got some, some bars on there that indicate the number of these, of these kind of weird events that are happening. And you can see that they're all isolated or are very much um, confined to this specific water layer, this, this very specific depth range, which is why things look so nice below 200 meters and don't look so nice above. Okay, this is, this is a plot with a lot going on. So I'll try to take you through it just step by step here. I'm plotting a different depth range. It goes between 40 and 160 meters, right? So I'm zooming in on this specific water region. I'm plotting salinity. That's this black curve. It looks fairly normal. Strong stratification, not so much going on. Temperature looks rather crazy, doesn't it? It's got all kinds of peaks and spikes in it, and it's going a bit nuts if you look on the, on the rather small scale. Um, okay, that's interesting. And that's gonna be a key to what's going on actually. Now let's look at the bars. The bars are actually the Cox number plus one again. So you can see that you've got some very high Cox numbers and you've got some very low Cox numbers. And with the color, I'm identifying them as events. Sorry, this LTHC means low, oh, what does it mean? Low turbulence, high Cox number is actually what it means. So it's one of these events that I'm talking about. And then if you've got a gray bar, you're in the sort of what we define as normal area. So you can see these are the events and they're more or less confined to regions where you have this very spiky, weird behavior of the temperature profile. And you know, this is okay density wise because everything is so strongly stratified in salinity, the temperature profile is kind of free to do what it wants. Um, and you see that happening. Okay, I think that's what I wanted to say here. Yes, so there's some kind of intrusive temperature structure that's going on that seemed to be captured by the events. So let's zoom in on this little section here. Now we're just looking at around 10 meters of the water column and you can see what's going on in a little bit more detail. You've got this weird sort of intrusions with temperature swinging back and forth on a scale of around a meter or so. And then if you look carefully within that profile, you can see that most of it's actually quite smooth and, and it's an indication that it's essentially laminar. It's not turbulent. There is a small turbulent patch and I'm gonna zoom in on the zoom in and go even closer so you can see it better. This is a turbulent patch. Those are turbulent scales. They're very small. They're on the order of centimeters or so. And then the rest of the profile is actually very smooth. So it kind of shows you what's laminar and what's turbulent. So you can somehow have all this, uh, this um, temperature structure without being turbulent. And I think the best way to understand what's going on is to look at a nice lab experiment that was done quite a while ago. And in this lab experiment, they took a tank of, of fluid. They had a linear salt stratification as I've sketched here like this. So you've got a density stratified ambient fluid, and then they just heated the left side wall of the experiment. And there was a dye, I think that was somehow on the left-hand side of the tank. I, don't, I didn't read the details of the experiment to be totally honest. And so you can visualize these layers. And what happens is you get this convection, this small scale convection that happens very close to the wall. And of course that extends into laterally into the, the bulk of the tank. And you get these interleaving layers that form like this as time goes on. So each, each one of these panels is increasing time of the experiment. We think that this is what's going on in the, in the Arctic. And the end product is a series of interleaving layers. So if you look at a temp temperature profile in this, um, in this experiment, you would see a kind of idealized version of what, what we see in the Arctic water column in certain instances. Okay, we have no heated sidewall in the Arctic. We're in open water, um, but there are blobs, I'll call them, of anom anomalously warm water that are 
sort of intermingled with the ambient colder waters of the Pacific water mass of the of the cold halocline, as people call it in the Arctic. So here is the section from the glider data. Again, I'm zooming in on this Pacific water layer, as I call it, and I'm plotting the temperature uh, on this color bar. This big thing here, this big blob is actually a mesoscale eddy. We don't find as many intrusions within the mesoscale eddy uh, for whatever reason, but throughout the, the data set, you have these, these kind of blobs of, of warm water that are very intermittent throughout the throughout this layer here. Okay, let's let's look at some of the scales of the observed intrusions. I did a quantification of two aspects or two scales of these intrusions. I looked at the, the temperature anomaly that's associated with the, one of these bumps. And here I'm sketching what I mean by this temperature anomaly. And here I'm showing the distribution on a logarithmic scale of this temperature anomaly. So you can see that, and, and this, these colors isolate, I think the, the middle 60% of the distribution, which is nice. It goes from, from um, 10 to the minus two to 10 to the minus one. So we see on average, a lot of variability, but we see temperature anomalies of around 0.01 to 0.1 degrees Celsius, which is actually rather a lot. And then let's quantify the vertical scale of the bumps. I'm going to do this with this H number, big H is going to be some sort of bump height. And here's the distribution also plotted on a log scale. We don't see as much variability in the vertical scale of the intrusions as we do in the temperature anomaly. And so we see again, 60% of the distribution is sort of isolated around one meter. So we're going to take one meter as an order of magnitude size for these intrusions and we're going to take this range of 0.01 to 0.1 for the temperature anomaly okay so are these the scales of what we would expect given that i just tried to convince you that this is what's going on you know what is what you see in this lab experiment where you have a heated sidewall and the salinity stratification well let's try to do some sort of check of this um, so based on lab experiments and numerics and maybe a little bit of field work, there's uh, what people call the natural scale or a natural height scale for these intrusions. And it's a simple formula and it's simple to understand. It's this little h, I'll call it. And it's basically just the buoyancy change that results in some lateral temperature difference between water mass one and water mass two divided by the ambient buoyancy gradient, right? So if you've got a buoyancy gradient that looks like this, and it's in terms of salinity, say, like in the lab experiment, and you've got a temperature difference of big delta theta between water mass one and water mass two, then if you transfer all of that heat, so all of that temperature difference to the ambient cold water mass, how high would it rise in the salinity gradient to reach this level of neutral buoyancy, that is this height, this natural height, little h here. So that's that's a definition that people have found, and they see that the height of intrusions seems to scale with this little h height, and the coefficient is around unity. Now notice that if we go back to the lab experiment, this height is changing as the lab experiment proceeds. You've got very small heights of the intrusions and they get bigger and bigger as they merge together. But you get less and less merging um, in later times of the experiment. So we'll just have to sort of use this as a very rough guide. And it's gonna get worse actually. We're gonna, in order to make a comparison between what's going on in um, say the experiments and the, the, the numerics, we're gonna to have to get at this delta theta somehow in the field measurements. And in order to do this, we're gonna to have to make what my, my PhD supervisor used to call an heroic assumption. We're gonna to have to say that the water mass temperature difference will be given by the maximum difference in each profile from the ambient cold water. So what I do is the glider dives and climbs, it measures the temperature profile. Sometimes you see this anomalously warm water mass, 
I'm going to take the maximum temperature from that water mass in that profile at each time. And I'm going to say that's an estimate of big delta theta. It's pretty approximate, but let's just see what it gives us. It's probably an underestimate. And so here I'm plotting that h, that little h value that you get by doing this. Uh, and that's in these um, lighter colors in this distribution here. And you can see it's got a range of values. But if you look at a median, you've got something that's around, I think, 80 centimeters or something like this. It's actually pretty close to the one meter. Uh, and that's the distribution of the, of the observed intrusion or bump heights. And that's shown in blue. So they seem to be rather close to each other. And that's maybe support, although not super convincing support, that, um, that these intrusions or this very strange temperature structure that you see in the profile is related to this intrusion process, this lateral intrusion process. OK. Let's look at how much mixing these intrusions can do. We're just going to take a very simple model. We're going to pretend that the bump is given by a sine function. It's got an amplitude that's given by what we measured, delta theta, and it has a height given by this h, which we also measure. Then we can calculate this dissipation rate, and now I'm calling it chi theta. I'm sorry, it's the same thing as chi t. Uh, sometimes people use t to represent temperature, sometimes people use theta. This is the destruction of temperature variance by um, molecular diffusion. You can calculate exactly this formula here. And now we can substitute in a range of scales that we observe to get an actual estimate, order of magnitude estimate, for what we would, what we would expect the dissipation rate be from these um, observed intrusions. And we get values between 10 to the minus 10 and 10 to the minus 8. That's in Kelvin squared per second. And now let's compare to the measurements. This is something we measured for the, for the Arctic water column. And if you look within the Pacific water layer, I'm plotting in red this range that we get from this idealized model and the scales that we measure. And here in the blue bars, I'm plotting the, the observations. So it looks like the range of the idealized estimates and the dissipation rate of temperature that we're observing can be can attributed to the, the presence of these um, these intrusive features. So weakly turbulent intrusive structures that we observe can explain this anomalous mixing of heat in the Pacific water. Okay, and I'm just at the very end here, but there's a way you can think about their development and the growth of these intrusions. And it follows this, this model from the 70s that was written by Joyce, uh, which is very nice. And it essentially develops a scaling for the horizontal intrusion length that consists of balancing vertical diffusion with horizontal advection, a very simple model. And let's look at it this way. Let's calculate a time scale for the lifetime of an intrusion against the vertical diffusion process. So we get a process of the destruction of this intrusion of height h by diffusion with diffusion coefficient capital K theta, which I'm allowing to be either molecular or, tur or turbulent. And this tau is this time scale. Um, from some of the work that's been done, the lab experiments uh, mostly on intrusions, they have a horizontal advection speed that scales, this is the gravity current scaling actually, with n times h. This is a, a big unknown actually, but um, this is the best we can do. And then we can look at a horizontal length that comes from essentially advecting this intrusion at velocity u over a time scale tau. And then the length that we get goes like this. It scales with, with n h cubed over k theta. I think the thing, the important thing here to pay attention to is the fact that k theta, the vertical diffusivity, appears in the denominator. That means we're going to get longer lengths as we have less vertical diffusion. So in the very, very quiet laminar environment of the Arctic halocline, you would expect long diffusion lengths. So this means that this uniquely low turbulence environment is expected to lead to longer and actually, in fact, stronger intrusions 
And maybe this is why we see them there. So there's a kind of compensating mechanism. Yes, there is very little um, vertical turbulent diffusion, but that allows for the lateral temperature gradients to create so much um, lateral interleaving that it sort of compensates for the lack of turbulence that's appearing in the water column, which is kind of interesting. Okay, then I'll just summarize uh, what, I, what I tried to cover in the talk. Uh, as I mentioned, the goal is to understand Arctic Ocean vertical heat fluxes and just heat flux, heat transport processes in general, because we're interested in, in knowing what's going on in the sea ice, if there's an oceanic influence to the, to the melting. We've explored this through what I think is a rather unique data set that was obtained by these, these autonomous gliders in a, in a coastal setting in the Arctic. We find very low turbulence that is likely dominated by tide topography interactions um, in the sort of deeper Atlantic water layers. Um, but there's a unique mechanism of primarily lateral heat transport that's occurring in the halocline that is not turbulent or is only very weakly turbulent and um, actually requires weakly turbulent conditions to, to be operating strongly. And then finally, this, this mechanism this mechanism arises through a kind of compensation of the temperature field for these very low turbulence conditions. Um, that's it. Thank you for your attention.